Remember when Arcane made good games? My name is Ice, and for the purposes of this video, we'll be flashing back to 2012 with the release of Dishonored, a mission-based stealth game that follows the quest of Corvo Itano, who's been dishonored, and stripped of his title, Lord Protector, after he becomes the scapegoat of a wicked plot to assassinate the current Empress Jessamine and separate her daughter, Emily, from a seat of power. But before we begin, the technicals. The game is small, not only in terms of playtime, but file size too, only taking six games gigabytes, not including the DLCs, which I do not own. And as for what can run it, well, just about anything at this point. Even if your computer is 8 years old, I think you could probably still play it pretty smoothly. Now, I did run into one crash, which occurred when I tried opening the gadget menu, but that seemed more like a freak incident than a recurring trend, but might as well note it. Performance alone, it ran smoothly, as it should for a game this age. So, without further ado, Let's begin. First, I want to discuss the setting of this game, which encompasses a lot of the experience, blending a unique art style, surprisingly detailed lore, and sound design to form a really neat, cohesive atmosphere that makes you feel like an assassin. Set in the fictional city of Dunwall, presented with a mix of industrious and steampunk aesthetics in a Victorian backdrop, where the mundane brick and mortar paints the outskirts, while the cleaner, more elaborate chateaus harbor wealthy nobility and resolute decorated forts house the most powerful elites. A world that emphasizes separation of class through its physical design, and is further complemented by intriguing lore related to characterizing the background events, the plague, wars, rises to power, and even doodads and trinkets. This world is obviously industrious, and throughout the game you'll be introduced to new contraptions and machines as they are invented. Lingering around these inventions is the looming threat of a plague, and beyond the material world, is the Outsider, an unknown entity that speaks to Corvo at predetermined intervals to discuss the decisions he's made and the overall implications they've had and will have on the world. The Outsider is tied into the material plane through those doodads and trinkets, characterizing a relationship between nature and the supernatural, particularly in the form of two items made from whale bones, runes, and bone charms. These items have their own subset of lore, but also play a crucial role in the progression of Corvo's powers, with runes serving as the power up currency and bone charms providing situational buffs ranging from broad applications like boosting HP to more narrow ones like rats being less responsive to your presence. It's interesting stuff really. There, there are even books that let you dive deeper into the city's lore if you're into that sort of thing. But this city is further bolstered by its sounds, chittering rats, the mechanical crunch of joints, ambient conversations held by guards just down the hall, and many others that signify the presence of things, whether it be items, enemies, or a heads up towards a hidden route. The music, though orchestral, is usually pretty quiet, drawn out, and tries to evoke thoughts of suspense and mystery. And as you perch on a lamppost over top of a guard, watching, adorned with your disfigured mask, as he walks up the street, then down the street, as a violent and hums. It makes you really buy into everything the game is showing you, the world it's presenting. On top of the tone and atmosphere of it all, the game holds another virtue near and dear, more in line with gameplay, and that's freedom. See, this game emphasizes player discretion. Want to run through the street fighting off any and all patrolmen? Or do you prefer a never seen, never heard type deal? Hell, even something in the middle is possible. And it's all supported by pretty much every pillar of this game's fundamental design. For one, its level design is phenomenal. Every bit of these zones are built to allow you multiple points of approach. For example, during the first level you've got this wall of light, and your objective is straight ahead. Some games may lay you into one specific path and give you a puzzle to solve or something. Not here. Instead, your possibilities and capabilities are entirely held by your creativity. For example, you can blast right through the wall, remove the oil tank that powers it and throw it at some guards. Or you can scale the wall to your left and pop right in. Or go around the right side, find this alley and enter from here. Or just skip it entirely by going underneath this bridge and taking a right at the end of the road. It's all done so well because you normally default in that stay hidden mindset, which leads you into naturally exploring each corner of the map to discover the most covert route, and finding that route feels good. It's something you don't forget, but given the option to make your own route after understanding the map is even better, which is where the powers shine. These powers are unlocked using those runes I mentioned earlier and can be upgraded by investing even more. One in particular is Blink, probably the most famous and noteworthy, which allows you to travel to a designated point in the Blink 
of an eye. It almost makes you feel like Goku. Which really adds to the creativity embedded into exploration by letting you look at a wall, seeing those arrows, and realizing, oh, the whole map is scalable. On top of that, you've got a few others, but these are more geared towards managing situations or creating opportunities between dark vision, possession, devouring swarm, and whirlwind. These five culminate your supernatural arsenal and help add utility to the tools you possess, those being a gun, crossbow, grenades, and traps, letting you imagine and commit war crimes in any way you see fit against AI that don't just simply stand around and stare at you. And this freedom is further pushed by what makes Dishonored so damn good its inherent replayability. This game from start to finish will run you about 12 to 15 hours between nine missions. It's not large by any means, but that doesn't account for how limitless and enjoyable the sandbox is. As I said, you can tackle every zone in any way you see fit, giving you multiple routes to explore. Then they'll lay in interactions, which cause some ripples with future events. And then there's also unmarked encounters you can happen upon too. These brief encounters can offer you dialogue to eavesdrop on, or maybe a key or hint needed to open a safe and get some extra money for upgrades at Piero's shop. These specific encounters and different routes, different playstyles, are also reflected by the game with its mission ending screen that displays your run's stats, your overall chaos which is pretty much karma, and it'll mark any significant events you accomplished while highlighting the collectibles you managed to find along the way. Say you're really just itching to play one specific mission again, well, you can! with the mission select menu. See, this game, it does something special, something a lot of modern games miss the mark on, and that's respecting your time. As I was saying maybe 45 seconds ago, it's a relatively short game, but its length is almost perfectly paced between all nine missions where an instance doesn't feel like it's lingering too long. Most missions your first time through might run you an hour, Maybe a little longer, most likely a little less, but after learning where you need to be and the ways you can get there, that time is cut severely, giving you so much room to experiment and mess around. It boils down to being just plain fun. I mean, check out some of the more diehard players' runs and see what's possible. I mean, you can throw bottles at people and they shatter. Hell, if you're not so inspired by the sandbox, then ramp up the difficulty. In this game, it actually changes the experience instead of just making enemies have more HP and do more damage. Damage. Here, they'll be more perceptive, which throws a wrench into your stealthing, making you consider your next move just a bit more. But I found even on normal, the AI is still responsive enough to not make stealth feel brainless. I just love it when a game actually plays to its genre's strengths instead of being a convoluted mess of patchwork systems. And as we reach the end, it's time for my opinion. I was surprised by this game. I didn't think it'd be nearly as enjoyable as it was, netting an 8.4 out of 10 in my eyes. My friend told me about it a year or two ago, explained to me it was level based and meant to be stealthy, and generally I like gritty combat and wearing cool armor, but I found playing as Corvo to be really nice. And despite starting the game killing people, after the second mission I refrained and went non-lethal, looking for a more stealthy approach, and I loved it. There was a certain charm associated to playing like an assassin that resonated really strongly with my enjoyment of the title. Is it as immersive as Witcher? No, not really. Corvo's a silent protagonist, so there isn't much to latch onto except for the characters he shows emotion toward. But don't take his silence as a bad thing, because personally, that's something I love about playing any character, filling in the blanks for myself. Corvo doesn't speak much anyway, letting his actions define his worth, and to that same effect, it just made me feel a certain sense of guilt, leaving a trail of blood behind my first go around. I wanted to be a benefactor, someone that could help the world heal, and leaving that ambiguity made me imagine Corvo as someone who is caring, a stalwart presence that holds justice above judgment. Of course, that's just me, and either way. Since then, I've replayed a few missions and went pure chaos just to see how it goes, you know. And you may have noticed, I didn't talk about the combat at all. So here it is. It's pretty okay. <laughs> it's not average or anything, you know. It's not rock'em sock'em. It does have time blocks, which is nice, but the best aspect of it is it's quick. There are no health bars in this game, except for Corvo's HUD. Every enemy takes one to two hits to defeat, and more often than not, every kill will have an accompanying finisher. It lends to a really snappy fighting style that meshes well with the portability of Blink. And I could really gush about how much possibility that simple tool opens up, but I'll spare you the rant and hope you find out for yourself. Hey, this is post-edit ice. I guess I forgot this when I was originally writing the script, but the game also doesn't have a new game plus cycle. 
Does it hurt the replayability? In a certain way, yes, but I still think it's still a really top-notch quality of the game. But, you know, some people really like New Game Plus cycles. I like them personally, too. Uh, so I, I thought that it was a little necessary for me to add this rather than just being a text blurb. Overall, there really isn't any aspect that disappointed me inherently within the gameplay, but I would have preferred that NPC interactions weren't so front-loaded. I'd say after the third mission, they kind of go dark, and according to the game's wiki, it was developed under a time crunch and received many revisions, so I'd assume that the DLCs are what make up for that, but again, I don't have them, and either way, all of my reviews will generally always encompass the unmodded base game, unless I state otherwise or make a separate video. I'd also have liked to understand more of Corvo's past, and apparently there's a book for that, but chalking up my only complaints to lore related aspects I think speaks volumes to what this game does with its limited time. And here's the kicker. The game is cheap. The base game is 10 bucks, and with DLCs, it's $20 USD. Uh, personally, I'd always wait for a sale, because there will absolutely be one for it at some point. This game is from 2012, so wish list it at worst. But if money isn't an object, I think there's far worse things you could spend 20 bucks on, or 10 bucks. By all means, go for it. This is a game you should absolutely play. Thanks for watching. I always appreciate your view, and I hope that my perspective or opinion has opened you up to a new game or experiencing something a little differently after watching. Uh, if you've been around for a bit, you may notice my reviews, or whatever you want to call them, it doesn't really matter. They don't focus on any specific technical insight or even a particular structure, because I, I just think every game should be tackled and presented differently. And these are the things that stood out to me, that would personally sell me on the experience. I think we tend to get so lost in the mechanical hullabaloo of video games that we forget or disregard what makes them fun. For me, it's generally not always the story, or the graphics, or even action sometimes takes a backseat. So I guess my goal is to kind of like bring you my experiences in a format you can digest, understand, and pick apart to maybe develop your own insights and thoughts. And if you have any, hey, leave a comment. I'd love to read it. I might make a video discussing what I like in video games at some point, but I have so many projects at this point that I want to get out, I, I can't give a timetable. We, we are inching towards another milestone as well, uh, 250 subscribers. Um, yeah, it, it's insane how quickly it's moving. <laughs> I mean, just like two, two to three months ago, I guess, uh, I was celebrating hitting 50 with my friends, and... Um, I just hope you guys know, it, it means the absolute world to every single content creator on YouTube when you show up for a video, comment anything, I, I mean seriously, some, sometimes I'm up at like 1am and I'll read a new comment and blush a little. Some of the stuff y'all say is the sweetest shit I've ever read. Um, but yeah, that, that's just me at least, I, I'd like to assume everyone. Uh, anyways, next week, uh, part four of my journey will be out. I'll be playing Bully in between and also working on a bit of extra content I talked about in part three. Um, I think in part three I said it'd be short. Uh, I ended up putting the idea down. I, I wrote some and realized that I wanted to be a lot more elaborate and in-depth. So it'll probably end up being pretty long. Um, might be my longest video uh, on the channel. But um, for the folks who just want a quick bite, I'll also write up quick rundowns and um, everything will be separated and chunked up by chapters. Uh, I don't have a timetable on that one though. Um, I am extremely hopeful that I'll have the willpower and energy to get it out before part five debuts. Uh, I just can't guarantee anything right now. But um, yeah, sorry for chatting so much, but I hope you're doing well and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.